Thank you very much. Thanks for selecting my talk here at DevOps Days. I know there's a bunch of good ones, and thank you for choosing me. So my name is Hector. I'm a senior software developer at Little Logic, and I'm the tech lead of the Dev Developer Tools team. The topic of my talk today is essentially the out of the three years of the automated deployments that we've had, like what are the lessons that we've learned so far? And just to set the stage a little bit here, uh, Alert Logic itself has been going down the road of automation for the past few years, and not just the last three years, but even before that. And uh, I want to show you some of the major pain points that we've encountered so far. Now, you may, not, may, may or may not have encountered these issues, but if you ever do, then, well, this will help you. So Alert Logic uh, was founded in 02, and when I first started, they told me that it started in the founder's living room, and I thought, well, our tech companies normally started in founders' garages. And then I thought for it 10 seconds, and well, really nobody wants to be in a garage in the middle of a Texas summer. So yeah, it kind of makes sense it's in the living room. So we're a security as a service company, and we have a base in Houston, and we have offices here in Austin, Dallas, Seattle, uh, UK, and Columbia. Um, and we do basically security monitoring, uh, threat detection, and we have a security operations center, and it's basically only one solution for your environment. Uh, you want more information, just elderlogic.com, and has all that stuff. So let's start from the beginning. Alert Logic has been around for, for a while, and before, we did a lot of on-prem installations. That means taking a, a big appliance and taking it to the customer side and plugging it in, and that's how we did the, the monitoring. And back then, servers were still pets and not cattle. And also, there was no concept of DevOps. And even though there wasn't one, we always tried to do automation. Um, we use a lot of Chef cookbooks when Chef was really, really beginning. Uh, and we built our own orchestration tools around it. Just to give you an idea, we created this orchestration tool called Environment Manager. And after a while, it grew more and more. And we ended up creating an orchestration tool for the orchestration tool that is called Environment Manager Manager. So needless to say, it's a complicated process in managing these boxes. And um, the challenges are that it's difficult to replicate for different customers, and updating the software was a, it's a challenge, and all these things. So fast forward or flashback to 2015. And this is when we start developing the new generation of our software which essentially will live in the cloud. And we partnered up with AWS. And just to give you an idea of how the landscape looked in 2015, that is like two centuries and internet years, uh, Lambda was released in late 2014. So nobody really knew what it was and what, what to do with it. Uh, Docker was just two years old. And ECS, which is Amazon's uh, container service, released late that year. So. We wanted to do this time the right thing and do infrastructure as code or continue to do it in a better way. Uh, we wanted to have a good build system for our services. And uh, we also wanted to do an efficient deployment pipeline. Now, the first lesson that we learned from all the experience we had before is that you want to have DevOps from day zero. Now, if you're in a company that doesn't have a lot of developers, it is totally fine and actually encouraged to use tools like Heroku and things like that that essentially give you this deployment out of the box. So it's actually recommended, right? So how do we start this? When we started the, the development of the next generation product, we established what we call the DevOps team, right? And it was the ragtag group of developers from different uh, disciplines that come together. And their job was to basically get stuff done remove all the blockers, get the software out to production. So for infrastructure as code, we started using CloudFormation. And everybody here probably knows CloudFormation and basically gives you templates that are blueprints to deploy resources in, into AWS. Now, these resources are, at least for infrastructure, is a low-level stuff like defining your VPC, your subnets, IP ranges, all these things. The goal here was... Uh, we saw the pain that we, that we had with the environment manager and those things. So we wanted to be able to reproduce this environment easily. And CloudFormation would fit the build exactly. We also wanted to be version control. We have all these JSON templates. They're in the repository. We can go back if something breaks. Pretty good. 
And the other thing is that CloudFormation takes care of uh, all the dependencies in your deployment. Like if you have uh, this subnet that depends on the VPC and that depends on this other thing, CloudFormation takes care of all that for you. Now, the other thing that CloudFormation does is that it allows you to deploy any type of resource, right? And those include EC2 instances. And the services that we deploy, well, that we build, were created in EC2. So we said, hey, let's use CloudFormation as well to deploy that. So the way that we created our build system was to create AMIs that had our software inside. That essentially was our deployment artifact. So the services, which are Erlang, by the way, get compiled down into an RPM. And then we grab a customized base AMI from Amazon, which is the Amazon Linux or whatever, and we groom it with Chef Cookbooks. We install our monitoring software, our libraries, all the things that we need. And we install that RPM into that base AMI. And that customized AMI then gets saved into EC2. So, so far, so good. And like I said before, the CloudFormation allows you to deploy the actual services as well, and not just your infrastructure. So far, so good. But then I want to show you a little snippet of a resource definition that we have. And here is an abridged version. Normally, this is around 100 lines. And I want to concentrate on two specific lines here. The first one here is the AMI ID. That AMI ID is generated by Amazon. And it, they give it to you. And we know that it's from a, one of our services. But what service is it from? What version of that service is this AMI ID? We have no idea. Right? The other thing is that as we're creating our, our new generation of software, we notice that all the services are kind of the same. Uh, they have a very similar pattern. So this template URL on the bottom, that is uh, the actual template definition that has all this stuff to deploy the service. And we're noticing that because all of them are the same, we're creating this file over and over and over again. So we have two problems that need solving. The first one is, how do we relate an AMI ID to the service? And the second, all services are the same, and they have the same configuration, so there's a lot of repetition. How do we fix that? So in comes the DevOps team, and we create this uh, AMI registry, which essentially is just a, a file. In this case, is the name of the service, .json. And within it is a, is a structure that has the version of your uh, software as a, as a key attribute. And the different um, regions, the AMI ID for, for that specific region. So that solves that problem. But we still have the problem of how do we put it into the template automatically? We don't want to be copy and pasting all the time. And we still have the issue of, the, of, uh, of all the, of the services being the same. So we came up with the idea of having a custom template. And as you can see here, this is a very, very reduced version that just has like a couple of, of uh, attributes. And we have the service. We have the AMI version and the region that it's from uh, and some other stuff like the, the instance, instance type. Now, needless to say, this is not valid CloudFormation. Yet we had our big template that had our infrastructure in there and a bunch of these little custom templates within it, uh, just to give you an idea how things got deployed. So we have this custom template, but how do we actually generate legit CloudFormation from this? And that's when we created this software called the Toolchain. There's a Ruby-based CLI tool that essentially has all the logic inside to do a bunch of stuff. And the first challenge here was to read the AMI registry, uh, by it parses out the first the confirmation template entirely, grabs the information that it needs, that is the version and the service, goes into the GitHub, downloads the file, reads it out, and now it has the AMI ID it needs. And using uh, .json.erb files, essentially Ruby templates, we're able to generate all this legit confirmation. So that solves the problem, and it gives us a lot of speed. Because now developers don't need to worry about how their software is created, how the configuration is. They just know that they go into the big uh, template file, they copy and paste the configuration, they change to their name and their version, and it'll get deployed. And the, generate, and the development progresses, and the toolchain, of course, gains more abilities. 
So it helps developers set up their dev environment. Let's say that they want to deploy some stuff. It helps them to do that. It allows to do customized deployments because our big file has our 30 services, but I only want to deploy mine. So the tool, because we are parsing the cloud formation, we're able to create this dependency tree within the, cloud, the, um, the tool chain and just generate the reduced set of cloud formation needed for your service. It also detects what changed between deployments, because CloudFormation back then in 2015 didn't have the concept of a change set. They, we just have a diff, and we have to figure out what services changed. It also did health checks with Sensu, because CloudFormation deployed a service, stand it up, and it works for CloudFormation. But we don't really know if that service is healthy or not. So our monitoring with Sensu is coming up, so we're querying the, 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 the service itself to make sure that the, it comes back healthy. And if it doesn't in a certain amount of time, well, guess what? We also handle rollbacks with this tool chain. And we do much more, more stuff that I could go on and on, <laughs> a complete talk about this only. So the DevOps team got the job done. Uh, it, uh, it enabled the launch of the next generation products. In a record three months, we were out in production from basically having nothing. So mission accomplished, right? But you know that there's a catch to the story. And it reminds me of that cursed monkey hand that you ask for a wish. And it grants you the wish, but it gives you dire consequences. So what happened is that change happened and that progress happened. So what does this mean? It means that now we built a service specifically for EC2, but then Docker is out. And now Lambda is out as well. So the templating situation we have doesn't work anymore. And also, we are a growing company, and we want to do compliance. We want to do certifications. And this means having certain steps in our deployment pipeline that we don't have. There's more regions to deploy. We're growing. We're deploying to uh, three or four different regions at the same time. So we just kept adding functionality to this tool chain. And it was hacky. And of course, everybody says this. We'll come back and fix it later. It works now. Let's move on. Everyone says this at some point. So what happens with the DevOps team is that they become something else. They're not, no, they're not enablers anymore. They become a bottleneck. And it's also very stressful because they, they're the ones that get paged when something goes wrong, right? The developers are always asking why their builds failed, because they go to Jenkins for their deployment, and they, all they see is this Ruby stack trace. And it's like, I didn't even write Ruby. Like, my stuff is in Erlang. What's going on, right? So the, the DevOps team is there in the hip chat or, uh, at the, that we use. And so send me the link. Look at the logs. Let me fix it for you. And because we're always in firefighting mode, we only have time to keep the wheels on the bus. And we don't have time to actually fix the system as a whole. So that is the life of the DevOps at this point. So what is the lesson here that we learned is that you always got a plan for change. Like You can solve the problem that you have immediately at hand, but you got to think about what's going to come later on and ad adequate your software in a way that allows you to accommodate that change, is at least adding unit tests or something for it, because this tool chain is not unit tested. <laughs> uh, the second lesson here is that you got to balance out the magic, right? Don't obfuscate things too much. A developer goes into the big CloudFormation template and just changes one line of, uh, in the template that isn't, isn't even real CloudFormation, and things get deployed. But the developer doesn't really know what's going, sorry, what's going on behind it. So not having that knowledge essentially makes things harder down the road. Also, let's go back to that build server we talked about. The DevOps team set it up, and uh, of course, it's a Jenkins and a VM that we have in our data center. And it works well for 10 services. But as we grow, now there's 100 of them. And each server has their own pipeline. So the service, server becomes overloaded. So overloaded that it takes three minutes just to load the first initial view, because there's so much stuff on it. And the problem here is that it becomes the single point of failure. When it breaks, everybody's blocked. So the idea here was that we were going to make this utopia where, hey, this is owned by all. We can, everybody can take care of it, right? Because the DevOps team is already busy doing something else. 
But the lesson here is that owned by all really means owned by none, right? Everybody has to have their own toys to play with, and you can't share that way, at least not like this. So in the end, this thing is problematic, but it's really successful because we went from zero to 130 deployed microservices today and counting. We have a combination of EC2, ECS, and Lambda within our cloud formation. The, de the developers can actually deploy to production with a single command, and that is very powerful. And it's also addressed com advanced compliance requirements. So just to give you an idea, uh, whenever a, a service changes in our company, we have to file this RFC or request for change, and it has to be logged uh, for, for compliance reasons. Um, so if your service is able to do successful deployments in a row, and it can actually run unit tests and everything, we call that service pre-approved. So you don't no, no longer have to create the RFC by hand. The RFC gets created for you automatically by the system. And that is the type of thing that we have today. And we were able to accomplish that with, with a tool chain, which is impressive. But that got us from 0 to 130 services. But how do we go to the next level? How do we go from 130 to 1,000 services? Right? How does this scale? So the first thing that we had was to do a tool chain rewrite. It was like, I'm going to make it better because this is our this is it's hard to change, and I know that more services are going to come in, and you know, but the reality is that the tool chain is huge, and you're oh so small. So, needless to say, it doesn't go well. And besides, you got to take a step back and see there are more things to improve than just the tool chain itself, right? We have this big, huge confirmation file that is owned by everybody, and. It, the goal is to have each service own their own cloud formation, own their own repo. We don't want to have this communal uh, cloud formation, right? You want to give developers control and freedom to experiment. Because right now, they're stuck with whatever template we gave them. And sometimes they want something different. And when they do, like, it's not easy to accommodate. Also, we don't want to babysit Jenkins anymore. So that's another one. So here the lesson is to identify and work on the right thing. And of course, this is very easy to say, but it's very hard. It requires experience. And you might choose the wrong thing here and again. And this is where company culture comes into play. Because you got to have the leadership and the kind of buying of the, of the whole company to kind of do the right thing. So what's the strategy then? Well, we keep the tool chain and the current process working smoothly, where we are, which we are. And we identify the areas of responsibility of the tool chain. Like, what are the actual things that this tool is doing? And from those, we want to create different pipeline services. Uh, these pipeline services are kind of little microservices for deployment. And we'll go a little bit more in depth in a little bit. We also want to build the next gen of the build and deploy systems, because right now we're tied to Jenkins and this whole mess. So how do we make it better? Uh, the change here, the main change is that the DevOps team now becomes a developer tools team. Because the goal here now is to create the tools that enable developers to change, create, build, deploy their new and existing services. And also, we want to leverage AWS services as much as possible. There's no point in reinventing the wheel here. If Amazon has a service, we really want to use it. And if there's a gap in a, in a service in Amazon, which Nine out of 10, there is a gap. We will code around it and whenever, raise a ticket with them. And whenever they actually fix this, we'll remove our, our workaround. So we're planning for that. So the new build system, how does that look? Well, we're making it based on code build, uh, Lambda, and step functions. Now, we try to do code pipeline, but currently it's kind of limited on what it can do. So. Code Pipeline, all it's doing really is connecting different jobs together. So what we're doing here is using step functions to actually connect the jobs together, and that's how the pipeline is created, right? Code itself, if you're familiar with it, essentially it's just a way to run a script within an environment, and you can really do anything with it. Currently, we have a solution that does uh, continuous integration. So. The good thing here is that each team gets their own instance. There's no longer a communal server. Everything's part of it at Amazon. And 
We can also leverage on new pipeline services. Here, of course, we'll have the shortcuts for the standard services that don't need a lot of customization, but we want to allow customizations as well from the beginning. Now let's go into the pipeline services because this is kind of the, one of the most cool, cooler things that we're doing. Um, we're, we took the iris responsibility that the toolchain has, and we created little serverless uh, microservices from them. Uh, and we created an, uh, an architecture, an infrastructure around these little microservices that include server discovery. We have a shared secrets and settings uh, that we can share between them. And uh, we use a client service pattern. And here I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on how that client service pattern looks. And essentially here, well, the the cool thing about um, uh, one of these pipeline services is that they're Lambda-based, and they have a, an API in front. So this API can get called from anywhere. So if you look here on the left side, we can call this from a command line tool using a client. We can load it up and use a web UI to connect and, and query this pipeline service, or we can do from Lambda. And the way the service client works is uh, just a Python library that gets distributed through PyPy, so anybody can really use it. And built in, it has a query for service discovery. Like the client or whoever is using this um, th this library doesn't need to know what the URL of the service is. The client itself will look into our service discovery, will say, hey, I need the URL for service X. It returns it, calls the API, and then the Lambda itself will do its thing and, re and return to to your Lambda or whatever it is, right? So this is kind of the, the pattern that we're following. And we have pipeline services so far for pre-approved services. So this is the thing that I mentioned earlier. We're keeping a list of which services are pre-approved. And this service gets queried and say, hey, is this pre-approved? Yes, no, OK, well, this is a microservices now. And this is not just a file in, in GitHub. The RFC ticketing system also is behind this. Um, it's pretty, pretty interesting how it works. And I could do a whole talk on just this one. And the artifact management service, the one that we saw at the beginning, is also part of the pipeline service. And we're developing many more uh, as we go. And just to give you a more in-depth example, I'm going to go uh, and explain how we actually are using the, um, how we're implementing change on the current system. Because it is hard sometimes to say, how do, OK, I have this new service, this new microservice. Like, How do I actually use it in the current system? right? Because everything's driven by this tool chain. So if you're familiar with um, this is just a refresher of how the old artifact looks like. It's just a JSON file with, a, with your, your information. So the artifact management service has this information now backed in, in DynamoDB. And the way we're doing it now in CloudFormation, how we're implementing it is with custom resources. And who here is familiar with custom resources? With OK. So just a quick explainer uh, what it is. CloudFormation essentially allows you to deploy any type of resource. It could be an EC2 instance, a Lambda service, anything. But it also allows, gives you a wildcard resource that says, hey, I don't know what this is. Do whatever you want with it. But, and the way that you kind of customize it is that you plug it with a Lambda function so when CloudFormation comes up, the custom resource gets instantiated. And what happens is that it just calls whatever Lambda function you tell it to, and it returns with some information. So this is, this is a super powerful tool, and we're definitely taking advantage of that uh, for this implementation of the artifact management service. So here's a look at what the Lambda function of the artifact management service is. Essentially, we're just getting a bunch of properties from uh, the call. And here's a client that we talked about. We're just doing a call. We're saying, hey, give me the service. Here's the service name, the version, the artifact type in the region. Give me that reference. What is that AMI ID? And here's how the custom resource gets instantiated. Uh, we give it a name. We say, hey, we, that type really can be anything that we want. So we, we typed in pipeline services. And we're giving it a, the ARN of the, Lambda, of the past Lambda function, which is the identifier for, uh, for Amazon. And we pass in the information as properties, like the type. If, is this ECS? Is this AMI? Is this a, a zip file? Um, we pass it in, the service name itself, the region. 
and what version do we want? Oh, well, I had it highlighted. <laughs> so then, how do you actually access the information? Well, think of it as an object. Here's a launch configuration resource. And here we're saying, hey, this is, the AMI, this is the image ID that I want you to get. You're getting it from the reference property of the artifact lookup CR custom resource. And if we go back, this is the artifact lookup custom resource where we're just sending in the information. And here is how the data is being returned by the Lambda itself. You know, It's just a data function that passes the reference. So, Pretty awesome, right? But this basically just allowed us to peel one layer of the onion. Like, there's a lot of stuff to do. But the lesson here is that the change has to be done in small increments. You got to constantly deliver value, and it will eventually add up to a full change. Because you try boiling the ocean before doing a tool chain rewrite, and you can't go six months or a year into your office and then come out the other side, say, hey, this is done, right? You got to be constantly testing your stuff out and making sure that it works. So in conclusion, um, let's go over the lessons. that You want to do DevOps from day zero. You want to always plan for change, because uh, it's very tempting to just work on the problem today, but you don't think about how things are going to change later on. You want to balance out the magic. Don't automate things too much. Uh, you got to make it obvious for developers what they want and what they do. Really, owned by all is owned by none. You got to identify and work on the right thing. And always do change in small increments. Constantly deliver value. And eventually, it will add up. So thank you. And I think we have a lot of time for questions. <laughs> or you can go grab a snack. Uh, we are for developers, the developer tools team. Uh, oh, and for Alert Logic, Alert Logic itself is like 200 developers, but the tools team uh, that build this pipeline service stuff is around four people, so myself and three others. And we built this first version to where we are right now. We started it last year around October or so, so in like six months. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, we identified that this query of GitHub and grabbing that artifact ID uh, was something that Toolchain was doing. And we, it was a very easy thing to kind of grab, create a microservice out of using this pattern. And the way that we're kind of implementing it in the new system, remember how we went back to this diagram? And um, well, yeah. And your service can be used by a lot of things, right? In this case, it's being used by a, a Lambda function, just get, getting the client, querying the service, and coming back with information, right? So, the sure. So, um, yeah. So very similar to the artifact one is uh, pre-approved services. So. As I mentioned during the talk, uh, when a service is well behaved and they have their automation in place and they successfully deploy like five times, we put them on the good boy list or whatever, and it's the pre-approved services, right? And whenever they want to deploy, they don't have to file RFCs anymore. So this list is kept on a registry very similar to this. And uh, we actually developed a Ruby client that calls the API of this microservice to be used in the tool chain, right? So we're kind of using the old big honking thing, 
but we're kind of peeling off a little bit from it and just making it call not GitHub or anything, but our own service. And later on, that service is still there. And when the toolchain goes away, that will just be called by something else. You know, so that is kind of how we're how we're working with this stuff. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we'll make it available. Yeah, that, that's a good question. And um, it's interesting how to measure cost, really, because how much does a developer's time really cost, right? When we're developing this toolchain, we want to do a new feature. It's so difficult to do that we're losing a lot of time. It becomes a bottleneck. So you quantify that much cost, right? But when you move to pipeline services, um, the, the cost in Amazon is, is really not that much because it's just little small queries here and there. So we're talking less than 100 bucks for the whole thing. Not even 100, like maybe 20 or something. Like really, really small cost. And we're keeping tabs on all this stuff, of course. I mean, um, if I tell you our, our real Amazon spend, this is like not even a drop in the drop of the drop of the bucket. Like <laughs> this, is, this is nothing, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, yeah, that's an awesome question. And actually, there's something that um, that I struggled with at the beginning because when I first started out, I was of the mindset of like, hey, let's rebuild that toolchain. This is what the this is what the problem is. I, I came from a full stack developer background, so I knew Ruby on Rails and stuff. And I oh, Ruby's my jam. I I can fix this, right? But it just became too difficult and. I keep getting frustrated because I started this project like a couple times and it kept getting shut down. So later on, we had a talk is like uh, with John, who's here actually. Uh, it was like, hey, what is the real problem here? What is the actual situation we're trying to fix? And that is when we started creating like, hey, well, you know what? Like the Jenkins stuff sucks. Like it's not just the tool chain. Like the whole the the. The fact that we have everything in one big cloud formation sucks. Like we want to have individual developers have their own uh, cloud formation. So he's part of the architecture team, and kind of together we built this strategy out, you know. And from there, they they made me team lead of the team. Kind of got a couple guys, and we started kind of cranking away. And kind of the condition was, yeah, you're gonna work on this stuff that is gonna change the whole company. But you got to show me progress as you go, right? So that's why I say um, small changes and show value as you go, because that essentially is like a snowball effect. You, you kind of start at the beginning, and you show, hey, look, we, we fixed this. And people see it and say, hey, that's actually pretty cool. OK, what are, what are you going to do next? You know, And we go move forward. Hey, we did this, and then we did this. And that gives us buy-in to do a little bit bigger projects, right? Because uh, once everybody's expecting the next big thing, you say, hey, guys, give me a little bit more time, and I'll give you a new build system, you know? And um, we're working on that. It's been brewing for the past couple months, and we want it to get released by uh, before the next quarter. So that is kind of the process that it followed. But basically, the beginning is the most difficult thing. Definitely, you need somebody on your side when you start. Uh, and But in the end, you got to convince the whole company. So that's why I say, Small increments show real value at the beginning and kind of let it go from there and kind of show your work, do demos, those types of things, right? <laughs> 